we must stay true to the true doctrine of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That everything that happens in life is the will of God. That's why we pray your kingdom come, your will be done. You have a destiny with Jesus Christ. It's what Jesus accomplished at the cross for you. It's what he accomplished by the shedding of his blood. Welcome to Times of Refreshing. I'm Pastor Doug Bryce, uh, pastor of Christian Life Center in Decorah, Iowa. And uh, we're getting back together to finish our study through the book of Colossians. We're going to be finishing the uh, chapter 1 today, verses 24 through 29. And I'm glad we get a chance to do this. Colossians is one of my favorite books uh, to go in. In fact, as I was looking at uh, the whole book earlier, I was thinking, you know, Lord, this is, a, this is a book I need to read more to understand better and better. This. It's, Paul really encapsulates so much of the gospel and reality in Colossians that if you just studied that book alone, you would pick up uh, so much spiritual maturity and foundation and understanding and discipleship. So uh, take your Bible with me. Uh, go to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 24 through 29. And we'll read through the scriptures first, and then we'll go back, and I'll begin to talk through each one individually, share a little bit, go off a rabbit trail here and there, and we'll wind up together on verse 29 And uh, as we wrap up uh, this half hour together. Uh, let's look at verse 24. And we'll start reading there. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present, you to, the, to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is in Christ, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in his sight. To this end I labor, struggling with all of his energy, which so powerfully works in me. So we're going to go back and we're going to look and see. Paul has just got done teaching. As, as we looked at in verse 23, 21 through 23, saying that you were an enemy of Christ at one time by our, the way we thought and the things that we did when we lived. We lived apart from Christ. But through Christ's physical death and resurrection, we are presented to God holy in His sight, without accusation, and we're blameless in the sight of God. Now that's a powerful truth. And, and Paul says, this is the gospel that you have heard and that is proclaimed to everywhere on the earth. Uh, every creature under heaven, in which he says, I am a servant of that gospel. So to be blameless in God's sight is a tremendously freeing um, truth. When I realize that my Heavenly Father looks at me, and he sees me as blameless. Now, even when I walk in sin, he brings correction in, because he says, son, that's not who you are. I've not made you that way. And I stand blameless because of the blood of Jesus. Now, Paul says, he goes on, he says, I am rejoicing even that as I preach this gospel, I suffer. And I'm suffering for your sake over this. And so he's suffering for the sake of people to hear this message and to grow up in the Lord. And so Paul is beginning to explain his work for the church. And I want you to hear me. Paul is doing work for the church. He's also working for the Lord. But he says, now I rejoice there. The word to rejoice means to rejoice exceedingly, to be happy, to do the happy dance in a sense. It, somewhere in his heart, there is a tremendous sense Of, uh, of joy and of what is right in spite of his suffering, or even because of his suffering, because he's holding to this gospel that is right. He says, I rejoice in what was suffered for you. So Paul's work toward the Colossian churches was causing him suffering in, in, um, in, in his life. You know, and, we, and Paul had a tremendous amount of persecution. There seemed to be a messenger of Satan and sin that would go ahead of him and stir up persecution. And when Paul would go in places, the Jews would be stirred up and they would persecute him. And you can read about that a lot in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 when he talks about all the things he had to endure. And how many times he took the lashes on his back and being stoned and people chasing him out of town. But he is, he is glad that he gets to suffer. And so how does, how, do we, how does one come to the point where we get glad to suffer? If we're preaching the gospel, he, even here in the United States, we're preaching and people come against us. We sometimes come to God with the attitude like, why, why, aren't, why is this happening? And we may get discouraged and disappointed about it or even be angry at God because we're in, uh, incurring some kind of a, a hardship 
because of the gospel. But we have to change our perspective on that to understand what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. He says this, Blessed are you when people insult you. Blessed are you when they persecute you. Blessed are you when they falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way that persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Paul has a right understanding. Later on in Colossians, as we get further, he tells us to set our minds and our hearts on things above. Paul has a heavenly perspective. That is why when he endures his persecution and his suffering, as hard as it is physically for him and probably mentally for him, because three times he asked the Lord, in my opinion, he's asked the Lord, I don't want to face these persecutions anymore. Have the persecution stop. And God says, no, my grace is good enough. My grace is good enough for you. And as you read through 2 Corinthians 11 and 12 in there, and he talks about all the sufferings he's had to go through. And as a man, just as Jesus did in the garden, Paul didn't really want to face that. In the garden, Jesus said three times to the Father, uh, if you, if you, I know you can if you're willing. Take this cup from me, but not my will. Your will be done. So often we operate in the flesh. Jesus in the garden was able to not operate in the flesh. The, the fleshly man was saying, no, this is too much. I don't want to do it. I don't like this. But the spirit of Christ, the spirit of who he was says, no, I'm going to do your will. And he had the uh, Hebrew says, uh, for the joy set before me endured the cross. So Paul here in the same way, he, he's not in, enjoying his sufferings for the suffering's sake. It's that he has a heavenly perspective on what is going on. He has a better perspective. He knows what the words of his Lord were in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are you because you have a great reward in heaven because they're persecuting you, and they did that, they did that to the prophets also. So he is rejoicing uh, in what the Lord has done. Now, this suffering also helps bring a, a death to ourselves. Galatians 2.20, Paul, in essence, says, I no longer live. The life I live, now Christ lives in me. I, the life I live, I live by faith in, uh, in the Son of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, 30 through 31, he talks about uh, having to fight lions and putting himself in danger, and it, it, that it's not for nothing, that there's a good reason, good purposes that he, that he is doing this. So Paul in verse 24 is letting them know, the Colossian church know, I am happy or I am rejoicing in what, what I suffer, and I'm suffering on your sake. I'm filling up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, that phrase has been difficult to translate or difficult for people to understand over the years. Is Paul saying that what Christ suffered on the cross and at the whipping post was not enough to purchase salvation and that somehow we as Christians have to, to complete a suffering? No, that's not what Paul is saying. The scripture is very clear that Jesus finished it. When he said it's finished, it was complete. So we're not talking about a suffering to, uh, to gain salvation in that sense. We're, we're talking more about a suffering according to what Jesus said in John 15, 18 through 21. He, he says, if they hate me, they will hate you. And if they persecute me, they'll persecute you. And so he's filling up in that. Acts 9, 9 16, uh, we get an understanding that Paul is going to suffer for the gospel's sake. Uh, Ananias, God says to Ananias, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name, talking about Saul of Tarsus and his conversion into Paul and taking the message to the Jews and the Gentiles alike. So I, I believe what Paul is saying is related to the commission that Jesus gave Paul. I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. Or another way to translate this here in Colossians is Paul is saying, I, I will take my share or I am participating in the sufferings of Christ. And uh, I can't remember exactly what scripture is. It's in 1 Peter 2, I think it says, that we are guaranteed. If there's one thing that we're guaranteed, it's guaranteed suffering. And, t and Paul tells Timothy that if anyone is going to live a godly life, he'll suffer. And so we think about that as Paul is re rejoicing. He has a heavenly perspective. I'm doing this. It's hard here in this world, but there's a great reward laid up for me. But not only that, Paul, I think, took con uh, consolation of the fact that he saw people come to the Lord, and come to mature in the Lord. And that, that meant a lot to him. So Jesus continues to suffer. Now, when the church is persecuted, Jesus is, is suffering. Because do you remember the words he said to Saul there on the road to, uh, to Damascus? He says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus didn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? The persecution that the body of Christ endured on the earth was persecution that Jesus suffered himself, 
in that sense that he identified with that. And so Paul is continuing uh, here to participate in the sufferings. He's filling up in his flesh the sufferings of, that Jesus talked about and that would happen, and really what, that Jesus suffers in a sense as the body is persecuted. And there is a lot of persecution in all of the world. November 3rd was the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, and we focused on that. And uh, so many of my brothers and sisters all over the world, in my opinion, deserve a much better resurrection and a much better standing before the Lord eternally than I ever will because uh, I probably will never have to suffer some of those things that they have to do. And I bless them and I pray for them and I pray that they will reach their persecutors with love and, and the truth. And so there's a lot that goes on and Paul is enduring some of this. So you see that in verse 24 that Paul is suffering but he's rejoicing because there are, there, it is the church that is being benefited through his suffering. Verse 25, he goes on and says, I have become its servant. Whose servant? He's talking about the church there. He talks about uh, that he is, he is facing these afflictions for the sake of, of Christ's body, which is the church. And I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in all of its fullness. So as we look at verse 25, Paul notes that he is a servant of the church. Now, we understand that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He was serving her. And that's Ephesians 5.25. So Paul is doing no less than what he knows his master and his Lord did, was to love and give himself up. Even if that means suffering, I will give myself up. Some of you, I want to challenge, some of you have been in church situations and it's been difficult. Maybe you had a, a strong ministry there and the pastor uh, asked you to change it or to step back from it. He wanted to do a different direction and you took offense in your heart. And I want to encourage you not to do that. I want to encourage you to, to, con to continue to see yourself as a servant to the church. And even if it's suffering in that sense or suffering in another sense, that you are serving the church or serving the Lord uh, by giving yourself for her giving yourself for the bride of Christ. So Paul is doing no less. He's sacrificing and suffering for the benefit of the church. Sometimes we get really busy. Sometimes I wonder if I should try to make more time at home, and I try to do that. I never want my kids to uh, think that Dad was too busy saving the world and didn't have time for their lives. And though there's important and healthy lines to draw, but there is a time that we sh should be serving the church in some way for the benefit of the church. So when you work in a local church, it's imperative that you remember it's not for your glory. There's a difference between ownership and possession. A lot of times you'll hear leaders say, I want you to take ownership, take ownership of this. And then sometimes when we grab onto a ministry and we're serving the church, we go over taking ownership and we take possession. And what I mean by that, we, we begin to think that it's ours. And if someone, someone else can't do it, or if, some, if, if the pastor asks something, uh, and, and it becomes uh, a possession of ours, instead of us becoming a servant of it. So make sure you don't cross over into possessing it. Some, that's a good place to be hurt. It's a good place to hurt others. Since in the body of Christ, we want to join in unity. So Paul is working here. He's serving the church. He's serving the, the bride of Christ. And this is Paul's understanding here. He wasn't doing it for his own glory. In fact, he was doing in spite of the suffering uh, that was coming. So encourage, I want to encourage you, everybody who should be serving someplace, you have a place to serve in the body of Christ. If you're not serving, the church is lacking somewhere. You have something powerful to give. And so I want to encourage you to be not just a pew sitter, but to get up and find a place to be involved in, in one way or the other in the body of Christ. So it was God's commission that Paul was following. Here in, verse, in uh, verse 25, he says, I have become its servant by the commission God gave to me. Sometimes the Bible will say a dispensation. Literally, the word means the management of a household or specifically the administration of someone else's property. So God is giving Paul the, uh, how, how did I say here, the administration of his property or the management of the household of the church. And that's an important thing to do. When you are taking care of something for someone else, then you want to do your best, especially when they've trusted you with a large responsibility. And that's what Paul's doing here, and that's why he's enduring the suffering uh, that, that's going on. Now, as you look back at verse 26, he talks about uh, what he's doing. He talks about this mystery here, and we'll look at that. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. 
So Paul is saying that God has this great mystery that for years and generations has been hidden, but now has been revealed to saints, to, to the saints, which is Christians. To the saints here in Colossians, he talks about Christian people are saints. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So Paul speaks of this mystery. It's been hidden a long time, and the mystery is in essence this, that the Jews are not the only one who are God's people, but that God is going to bring the Gentiles in under, through Christ and make them one new man, that God has torn down the dividing wall of hostility, bringing one new man together between Jew and Gentile. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10 talk about Jesus being worthy because by his blood he has purchased people from every tribe, tongue, and nation on the earth. So God is wanting to rescue every person. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And for a long time, it was the, it was the understanding that God's chosen people were the Jewish people, and they are, and they still are, but it was through the chosen people, through the seed of Abraham, that, the, that, uh, Jesus, that God promises Abraham, through you all nations will be blessed, and through the seed, meaning Jesus. Galatians teaches us that was one person he's talking about, Jesus being the seed of Abraham, and through him we are blessed uh, to have the same blessings that Abraham, the man of faith, had. And so we have this great mystery that was hidden, and he talks about the glorious riches of this mystery. What is that mystery? That Christ in you is the hope of glory. Your hope of glory doesn't lie in your ability to fulfill the law anymore. It doesn't lie in any other thing, any other thing that you can imagine. The hope of glory is that Christ is in you, not only for your eternity, but also for your today. That, that's a powerful thing. Christ in you is the hope of glory. He goes on to say that this, this has been made known uh, to, or has been disclosed to the saints. Now, I want you to see, if you have a Bible, turn it over to Hebrews uh, chapter 10 very quickly. We'll look at uh, verses 10 through 14. The word saint means a holy thing or a most holy thing. And so Paul in his writings, oftentimes you'll, read, you'll hear him say to the saints of Ephesus or to the saints of Colossae. And he goes on and he says this in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 10. And, and by that will we have been made holy. He's talking about Jesus uh, willing to obey the Father's will and to go to the cross. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, uh, day after day, priests stand and perform his religious duties, and again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when this priest, meaning Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be, to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy." So there's this past tense action that I've talked about in the past that through the work of Christ, we've been made perfected uh, forever. We've been made holy. And there's this present tense action of the blood of Christ, or the sacrifice of Christ, that, is, uh, that we are continually being made holy. That can be also a, our sanctification as we grow in that. But there is something that God has done in us that he has made us holy once for all. As Paul teaches, as long as we continue in the faith, we have this great and precious promise. And so the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write the scripture, and he inspired him to call Christians most holy things. And it may challenge some of your understandings of what a saint is, but the Bible says very clearly that normal Christians are called saints because the work that Jesus did on the cross was so powerful and so strong that God made us holy. And that is what the word saint means. It means the most holy thing. And so that's a powerful truth there. And he goes on. Now, verse 27, uh, look back at your Bible there, and we'll, and we'll read that. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles. To make to, to, uh, who, who's he talking about? The saints, the church. To them, to Christians, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is, in, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So to us, God has chosen to reveal his great love for all people. Peter got this revelation in Acts 10.34 when God convinced him to go into a Gentile's house. 
which was a mass, which was a massive undertaking for a Jew who was never going to go into a Gentile's house, into a, a Gentile dog's house, and and uh, and become unclean because of that. And God had to give Peter this vision three times and, and say, hey, I've made everything clean, it's okay. And, and Peter goes in obedience and Cornelius' household, the Gentiles, the gospel comes to the Gentiles and people get saved because Peter was realizing God loves everybody, and he has, whether they're Jew or Gentile, and he's trying to reach them. And he's shown that to the saints. The first saints were the Jewish people. And Peter gets this revelation that God is... Uh, powerfully working for the re redemption of all of mankind. So what kind of implications does this carry for you? What, is it, what kind of implications does it carry for me? Christ in me is the hope of glory. Christ in Paul is the hope of glory. And therefore, verse 28, we proclaim him. One of my favorite things to do, and I don't live near Sam's Club anymore, but I live near Walmart, because Walmart is everywhere, Right? We need to become Sam Club samplers. I mean, how many of you just love to go to Sam's Club and you walk down the aisles on purpose to find where the sample booths are at to go up and get a sample? I do that, and uh, I'm probably not the only one who, who does that. Christ in us is a hope of glory. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. How is the lost world supposed to taste and see that Jesus is good if it's not through their experience of us? If it's not for us showing them that Christ in us is the hope of glory, that Christ, some of you guys have been set free from drugs and alcohol and other, all other kinds of things, and you, have, you know people or you'll run into people who have lost their hope that they'll ever completely break out of that, that they'll, they, they feel like they'll be forever stuck in that bondage. And yet you have a testimony that says, no, God, uh, Christ in me was the hope, the hope of glory, the hope of freedom. Uh, to that. Oh, that we would realize that Christ in us is a hope for all people, that we would share Christ, that we would let people taste and see that the Lord is good, that we'd be Sam Club samplers for other people. We need to advertise the greatness of our God and let people taste and see, because Christ is in us, and he is the hope of glory for us and for all of mankind, for all different people. So Paul is saying, because of this, in verse 28, uh, he ends in verse 27, Christ in you is the hope of glory. We proclaim him, he says in verse 28, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may pre present everyone perfect in Christ. So we proclaim, we preach him, we show him, we talk about him. That's what we need to do. Now, the, we need to let people know we can proclaim with our lips and our actions and all these different ways. The devil uses the same techniques. That's what a drug dealer gives a free sample to somebody and they get hooked. And they come back and they begin to buy. We need, to, we, need to, we need to hook people. We need to give Jesus freely, not demanding of people. Show them Jesus in us. Let, let the addicting love and power of Christ draw them in and win, them over to, win their heart over to him. The Bible says to proclaim him, to announce, declare. There's no closet Christianity. There's no privatizing our Christianity. We're to admonish, which means to warn and exhort. And Paul did this and... The different ones turn away from the sinful generation. Peter talks about that. We're to teach. And admonishing and teaching helps people grow. Paul wants to have spiritually mature people. He doesn't want to have Christians um, who, who don't grow. Here's a great thing I picked up with, in my talk with, uh, I, talked with an, uh, I talked with this man who's just, com he's way beyond me in my education and uh, he gave me a pattern for spiritual growth. And I thought it was so awesome because he, he doesn't believe in God. He believes in evolution totally. And he's a, he's a published man. I'm not going to say his name, but I've had to talk with him. I'm going to have some more. And he said, here's a pattern for spiritual growth. He said, uh, uh, broaden your knowledge, deepen your understanding, because you can know something but not well, and expand your love. Now, this has come from an atheist who doesn't believe there's any God, any miracles. That evolution is absolutely true. He's a well-published man. His, his, article, his books are out there being used as, as uh, textbooks. And I thought, he is exactly right. Paul does not want spiritually immature people. That's why he teaches. He's expanding people's knowledge. He's trying to deepen their understanding, or he's broadening their knowledge, trying to deepen their understanding and teaching them to love. And we're not to be spiritual infants. You are to be, a, most of you by now should be Sunday school teachers. Most of you by now should be teachers. Hebrews chapter 5 says, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, most of you should be teachers. By now you should be teachers. 
If you've been a Christian for over five years, you should be teaching somebody. If you've been a Christian for a year and a half, you should be teaching somebody. You should now be a teacher of the Word. You should be doing what I'm doing right here, whether it's in front of a camera or not, sitting down and teaching others the Word. That's how Christianity uh, promotes and grows. You're to be growing in the Lord. You're to know the Word of God yourself. And you're to be able to know it in such a way that you can teach others. And so Paul is teaching and admonishing people because, look at this, he wants to present them perfect in Christ. And that means complete. He wants them to be made complete. You need to grow. There are, there are carnal Christians and fleshly Christians. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, I couldn't teach you the way I wanted because you're carnal. You're very fleshly Christians. You're, you're immature. You're an infant. Don't be that type of a Christian. Get into the Word of God. Walk closely with the Lord and become a teacher. The reason I'm on this, this teaching uh, show today is because years ago, my youth pastor uh, threw the Sunday school lesson book across his living room onto my lap and said, you're teaching next week. And I was like, uh uh-uh, no, I'm not. He said, oh, yes, you are. That's why I'm here today. So Bob Swift, you ever see this? Thank you. It means more to me than you ever know. You're to be a teacher. The Lord wants to use you. Don't grow, le- don't grow weary. Let's look, look at verse 29. To this end, I labor, struggling with all this energy which so powerfully works in me. Don't, don't grow weary. Paul says, I labor, I struggle with all of God's energy. To labor means to grow weary and tired and exhausted. Paul says, I grow weary, tired, and exhausted. I'm doing everything I can. But where does it, Paul get this energy to do this? Through a close, intimate walk with God. Paul knew God, and God knew Paul. Jesus says, uh, I, I know you. We can know God and he can know us. Even the demons in hell knew Paul, if you look at Acts 19. So Paul uses God's energy. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power, preaching with the demonstration of the Spirit's power so that men's faith may rest in the power of God and not in the wisdom of man. And so I want to get you back to the reality of verse 29. Oh, Christians have to get back to the idea that with the ability of God, we can be bold and yet humbly proclaim that God's supernatural power works in me. As a Christian, can you say that? I'm going to leave this last thought with you as I sign off here. You need to get to the point where you can say, God's power works in me in powerful ways. Come to that point. Let him work through you. Love this world in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. God bless you. We'll get back together next week for Colossians 2. If you would like to buy a DVD of this program, please send $10 to KFXB-TV, 744 Main Street, Dubuque, Iowa, 52001. Please be sure to include the episode number on the screen.